Amen. What a great time of worship this morning. It's good to be back with you. We miss you all when we're gone, but it's so good to be home with our family. I love it. And today has already been mentioned, it's we begin the Holy Week with Palm Sunday. As I think of Palm Sunday, I think of a, a message, a story I heard some time ago about Corey Ten Boom. If you don't know who Corey Ten Boom was, she and her family helped during the Holocaust to get a, tons of Jews out of danger. And uh, she became very notable through her life after World War II, standing for Jesus Christ. So one time she was asked, she says, they asked her, Corey, uh, is, is it difficult for you to remain humble? She thought about that and had a very quick reply. She said her reply was this, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on the back of a donkey, and everyone was waving palm branches and throwing garments onto the road and singing praises, she paused for a second and said, do you think that for one moment, it ever entered the head of that donkey that any of that was for him. And then she said something that I think is great. If I can be the donkey on which Jesus Christ rides in his glory, I give him all the praise and all the honor. What a response. I'm not calling you all a bunch of donkeys, okay? Okay. But, you know, to realize the most important thing is that we walk with Jesus Christ. Amen? So Palm Sunday, typically we look at Christ riding in on a donkey to Jerusalem. That's the classic. Crowds waving palm fronds saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But what I want us to see this morning is that the road to Jerusalem's Palm Sunday celebration which was really short-lived, was also the road to Calvary. And so for our text this morning, it's a rather long text, we're going to turn to Luke 19, verses 28 to 40. It reads this way to get us started. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going on to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there with no one, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked him, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to, brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near to the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. In this text, Dr. Luke transports us back to the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. What a week it was. And you know, when I think of Palm Sunday, I call this text the illusion of victory. The illusion of victory. You know, with his instructions to the disciples to go and find this colt in the village, Jesus seems to be doing exactly what they all expected him to do, didn't he? Take charge. Make a bold statement. Just exactly what his disciples expected of him. Enter Jerusalem as the Messiah that you are. The crowds in Jerusalem have swelled at this point to several, several hundred thousand people crowding the streets throughout Jerusalem, preparing for the Feast of the Passover, which was the most memorable feast in the history of the Jewish people. See, the Passover feast celebrated God's deliverance from the hand 
slavery in Egypt. And to do that, part of the ritual was to take and have a cedar meal of lamb and bitter herbs and some other symbolic food uh, that would remind the first century Jews that God freed their ancestors from the oppression of Egypt. Passover. And now, today, years later, the prayer that they have in Jesus' day was that God would free them, Jews, from Roman rule. Thoughts of freedom and memories of the Maccabean revolt about 150 years earlier were still in their hearts, in the minds of faithful Jews. They wanted someone to be a revolutionary and revolt against Roman rule. You know, it's kind of just as we look at our war for freedom, the Revolutionary War. So these first century Christians, or Jews, I mean, kept alive the hope of freedom. So when Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem on that first Passover week, the crowds are looking for someone to rally around, someone to carry the banner of revolution and gain freedom and liberation from Roman rule. That's what was happening here. But we need to get this understood. Jesus was not traveling the road to revolution. He was traveling the road to Calvary. He was not there to overthrow Rome, but to save our souls. You see, these folks looked for something temporary. Christ's eyes were on that which is eternal, our salvation. And along the way, several things happened this week as we go through this week, looking from Palm Sunday to Resurrection Sunday. <clears throat> now at this time, even the disciples uh, comprehend that Jesus is heading toward his, are not comprehending that Jesus is heading toward his death at the end of the week. In fact, every time Jesus would mention the possibility that he'll be mistreated, the disciples protest that he is even speaking such a thing. They didn't, they didn't understand it themselves, and they'd been with him for three years. Each one vows to defend and stay with Jesus regardless of the outcome. So as Jesus rides into Jerusalem that Sunday morning, the disciples are joyous. The crowd is energized, and shouts of Hosanna ring out as he rides slowly through the crowds. Now, the word Hosanna is an interesting word. Sometimes we think it's a word of praise. It's not. It's a plea. Hosanna means, God, save us now. Save us now. You see where their eyes were at? Looking to Christ as deity and praising him. They thought he'd be a revolutionary that would save them now from Roman rule. They didn't understand. The crowd from all the Mediterranean area who had arrived for the Passover is longing and yearning for freedom from Roman rule. That's all they could see. And they despise the presence of the Roman centurions in the city of David. They hate the Roman troops parading through the streets of Jerusalem, holding high the standard bearing the Roman eagle. They hate shopping in the market square and paying merchants with Roman coins stamped with the likeness of Caesar. They hated it. Rome's presence, Rome's power, Rome's dominion is seen everywhere. Even in their court system, where the governor of Rome administers Roman law, overriding their own high priest and religious leaders. So as Jesus rides into Jerusalem that morning, the crowds that sing and shout and follow him are only admirers, admiring what he may do for them temporarily. I call them fans, fans, because of what they expected Jesus to do for them. You see, they like that Jesus stands up to the corrupt political leaders and religious figures. They like it that Jesus seems to be a man of the people, that he eats with sinners and even talks with prostitutes. They've been looking for a hero, and guess what? Jesus is the flavor of the day. They're going to put all of their bets on him today. In addition, there were reports that Jesus could heal people, feed people, and that when he prayed, evil spirits even fled out of some people that was possessed. So see, they admired Jesus because they saw him both as a revolutionary and a mystic, not as deity. And for them, that was a great combination to place their hope in. 
This is key. Admirers always see what they want to see in their hero of the day. That's what they do. That's what an admirer does because they're focused on what you're going to do for me. You see, and what the crowd saw in Jesus was the son of Joseph, a revolutionary, not the son of God, a redeemer. <laughs> when you begin to understand where their mind was at, you begin to understand how they could be so confused and what trans trans ha happened just a few days later. They wanted another Maccabee, not a new Messiah. In short, they admired Jesus because they thought he was the answer to all their temporary problems underneath the rule of the Roman Empire. I spend quite a bit of time on this because what you will see is that we can easily do the same thing in our Christian faith. Get out of the immediate problem instead of focusing on the living God and his plan for our lives. So when Christ makes it clear that he was not a revolutionary, it's no wonder that by the end of the week, those who admired Jesus on Sunday were shouting, crucify him on Friday. Fans are always fickle. They are. You see, the difference between a fan and a follower of Jesus Christ is this. You can be a fan of something without being a follower. A fan for because a fan, when things get tough, or their team goes down, or whatever, they go, they're out of there. They're gone. Fans are up and down with the circumstances. They do not stay loyal, but true followers of Jesus Christ stay loyal to him no matter what. Think about people you've known in your life, Christians. All of a sudden, God allows, he's sovereign, he allows something into that life. It could be a spouse that passes away, a child that goes totally down the wrong road, a financial collapse, and what happens is the foundation is, sh is literally shaken of their faith. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're going to trust him. But if you're just a fan, you're going to walk away and say, that's not my God. That's not what God does for me. And we see it so much of the time, don't we? God didn't do what I wanted him to do. That's where they're at here on Palm Sunday. Next on the road to Calvary, in addition to some fans and admirers, Jesus picks up opposition. Opposition. You know, what's otherwise a jubilant scene of singing and shouting and celebration, the Pharisees hear all the commotion. Rushing toward the sounds of the joy and the laughter, they quickly size up the situation. Jesus' followers are proclaiming him as king. And just as quickly, the Pharisees shout out to Jesus, rebuke your disciples. Stop this nonsense. You, you'll upset the Romans. And guess what? You're no king and no messiah. You gotta love Jesus' reply, his humble reply here. He says, if even if I tell my followers to be quiet, these stones will cry out with joy. And you know what? In your life, in my life, at those times that we don't want to praise God, the stones, all of creation and nature will shout out, hallelujah, and praise to the living God. And in that point in our lives, we miss out on joining in in that wonderful chorus of celebration and praise to a living God. You know, Jesus had faced opposition from the very beginning of his ministry. Think about it. In Nazareth, the synagogue crowd really didn't like his interpretation of the prophet Isaiah. When he spoke with wisdom and helped them understand, they just couldn't get that far. When Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath, the Pharisees accused him of being a Sabbath breaker. When he reinterpreted the Torah, the law of Moses, they murmured against him. When he proclaimed that he would tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days, they tore their clothes and shouted with disapproval. 
because they just didn't understand what he was speaking of. But now the opposition was determined to stop Jesus. That's where they're at. He was too popular, too charismatic, and too much trouble for him to be allowed to continue. That's where they're at. We've got to get rid of this guy. He had to be stopped even if they had to kill him. And it began. And it didn't take long for it to come to fruition. You know, opposition to Jesus is nothing new. Think about it. Sadly, it's never going to go away. Many of us have experienced those who resent us for living by God's standard, being mocked, criticized, laughed at, perhaps even, even stronger than that. I remember when I became a Christian, all my friends left me, and I understand why. They didn't want to follow Christ and the things that I was doing. It just changed everything. It was hard. Sometimes it's very hard. Millions around the world are persecuted and killed for choosing to follow Christ today. Oppression. Opposition. Christ said, don't be surprised if they hate you. They hated me first. You see. I remember reading some time ago this article in the Washington Post. It was written by the late Dr. Billy Graham. It was about heaven and hell. It was a very brief reading and the hope that we have in heaven. Mr. Graham said that the best thing about heaven was that God wanted everybody to be there. And Dr. Graham went on briefly to say that we do not get to heaven by our own works, but by the sacrifice of God's Son, Jesus. And the, but it's amazing, all the comments that followed came in on this. One said, Billy seems to miss that there is no evidence of the reality of heaven or hell. Independent of the internally inconsistent ramblings of a 2,000-year-old document, the morality tales of Dante, and the pre-biblical folklore that they were cribbed from. Another comment, it sounds nice, too bad it's not real, and it doesn't exist. There are a number of, all, beyond that, there was a number of comments when you read them that attack Dr. Graham's character. Outrageous, outrageous gibberish from a totally deluded man of the cloth. When you die, Mr. Graham, you'll simply cease to exist. No heaven, no hell. Just death and nothingness awaits you and everybody else. For once in your life, get real. Well, today, Billy Graham knows that it was real. And he's walking hand in hand with Jesus Christ. Same thing that you and I will be doing someday. When all these accusers are done, your hope is foundational and it is real in Jesus Christ. Amen? Have you ever heard any of these kind of accusations in your own life? I have. How many times has the point, finger pointed at you? <laughs> and almost hate. It's to be expected. You know, if you go through life and no, no one ever accuses you of your faith in Jesus Christ, time to rethink it. <laughs> Maybe it's too camouflaged in me trying to be a nice guy. It's the letting people see Jesus Christ, people that need him tremendously. You know, there have always been and will always be those who oppose the work of God, who reject the love of God, and who ridicule the Son of God. And that goes for every one of us who choose to follow Jesus Christ. But knowing all of that, just like Jesus, we keep on going, sharing John 3, 16 and 17. You know it well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through his sacrificial death. That's the gospel in a nutshell. And everybody's going to either accept it or reject it. Those who try to ignore it, it's the same as rejecting it, isn't it? But we keep praying for those dear people. You see, the key truth here is that the world that God loves includes every one of those people who oppose him and even those who nailed him on the cross. 
They are the ones for whom Christ died. They are the recipients of God's grace. And their sin is no worse than ours. Jesus said it best. The well have no need of a physician. (laughs) Jesus came especially to those who opposed him, to those who belittled him, to those who ridiculed him, and to those who crucified him. And he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Unbelievable. And what pleases Jesus the most as I think of this is when we love them enough, all of those who would want to ridicule us, those who want to walk and turn their back on Jesus Christ, what pleases Jesus the most is when we love them enough to share the gospel message with them. And if they don't want to hear it, we just continually pray for them. Amen? That's why the church is here. Well, finally, on the road to Calvary, Jesus picks up the cross. At this point, the life of Jesus isn't very different, really, from the lives of any other charismatic leader. Think about it. Some people follow him for the wrong reasons. What can he do for me? What can he do for me? Others oppose everything that he's doing, even when he's helping others. But there's a twist to this story. It's unlike any other story of charismatic leaders, Jewish or otherwise. This unique event, you see, isn't even reflected in the passage that we already read today. For in reading the story of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, we can easily forget the reason for his coming to Jerusalem in the first place. Jesus did not come to Jerusalem to hear the crowds shout, Hosanna. Jesus did not come unaware of the opposition to his ministry. And what was going to happen? Jesus did not come to Jerusalem for Palm Sunday. Jesus came to Jerusalem for Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. On the road to Calvary, not only does Jesus pick up uh, some admirers, some fans, some opposition and opponents, but most importantly, Jesus picks up the cross. But you might say, well, gee, Pastor Doug, today's the day of fun and celebration. Hosanna in the highest. Let's leave the gory details to this coming Friday. We could do that. Today we could just celebrate Jesus' triumphal ride into Jerusalem. Next Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, we could celebrate the victory over sin, death, and the grave. But let's not forget that the road Jesus traveled led not just to Jerusalem, but through its streets where he was mocked and jeered. The road that Jesus walked was a road that did not end in the city. It continued out the other side through the city gates to a hill called Golgotha, Calvary, the place of the skull. It's on this road that Jesus picks up his cross. Now let's talk about that for a minute. We usually phrase it in the passive voice, grammatically saying, Jesus was crucified. That's true. The Passover uh, crowd demanded it. Pilate confirmed it. And the Roman centurions did it. They nailed Jesus to the cross. But just to say Jesus was crucified, or they crucified Jesus, if we just say that, we really miss the significance of what really is going on here. You see, Jesus chose. He was not a victim. He chose to pick up that cross. He did it willingly, sacrificially, obediently to his Father because he loved every one of us here and those watching at home. Don't forget that. Don't just say, yeah, Jesus was crucified. They didn't do it to him. He chose to do it for each of us. Amen? Paul says he became obedient unto death, even death of the cross. In Philippians 2. Jesus said in John 10, 18, I lay down my life, no one takes it from me. And he laid it down for you and for me. Grace. Grace. 
amazing grace. You know, even though he struggled, even though he wept tears of sorrow so great that it was like drops of blood, Jesus picked up the cross. This was no easy thing. I don't even believe it was just the physical. I believe it was the sin of the entire world, past, present, and future, laid upon him. And his father God turning his back on him because he couldn't look upon sin. It was more than physical. It was spiritual. It was psychological. It was emotional. Tremendous oppression. You see, the road to Jerusalem was not the highway of Hosanna's. The road into the city was not the concourse of cheers. The road to Jerusalem was the road to Calvary, period. Jesus knew it. The disciples didn't. Jesus walked it. The disciples only followed for a time. Jesus embraced it. His followers fled. And all of that was for our forgiveness, our salvation, our eternal life with Jesus in heaven. And so the only thing that really matters as we look at Christ riding into Jerusalem on the road to Calvary is how will you and I respond to this act of sacrificial love from the God of the universe? How will we respond this morning? It is because Jesus picked up the cross and gave his life that we can live eternally. It is because Jesus picked up the cross that the world was forever changed, that lives were forever made whole, that sin lost its death grip on humankind. He broke the chains of sin. The fetters were loosed, were free to serve him and love him back. So my question for each of us this morning is this. Have you received this free gift of salvation from a God who loves you so very much that he gave his son to die in your place? That's really the question that it begs, isn't it? And I would be out of line if I didn't ask that question this morning. If not... Today, you can make that decision. So I'm going to ask everyone here now, before we close, to bow their heads. Whether you're here in this auditorium or you're watching on TV this morning, if you've never made a decision to ask Jesus to become your Savior, I'm going to encourage you to do it with me right now. And all you have to do is follow me in a simple little prayer and pray it quietly in your heart to Jesus. If that's a decision this morning with your heads bowed, just pray quietly in your heart with me. Dear Jesus, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I know that you went to the cross of Calvary and that you died for my sins, sins that I could not ever die for. It took perfect blood to be shed for my sins. So today I repent and turn from my old ways. That means I turn, Father, from doing what I am doing and I'm going to turn and follow you and obedience. Thank you for coming into my life and making me clean before God your Father. Amen. Now, if in this auditorium or you watching online, prayed that prayer, I want to be the first to welcome you into God's family. I'd like to know about it. If you can let me know about it, because I'd like to pray for you and do anything I could to help you in this new journey. It's a joy. So as we begin the Holy Week today and continue 6 o'clock on Friday for our one-hour Good Friday service and our two services on Sunday at 9 and 11, spend time to thank God this week. Be have hearts of thankfulness to a God who loves you so much that he gave it all for you. Don't take it for granted. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for riding into Jerusalem even though you knew it would mean sacrificing yourself for us. This morning we praise you again for a love that we could not ever 
repay. And today, for each of us who have said thank you for dying for me and have received your gift of grace, we're going to celebrate our salvation, knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt, Father, that we will spend eternity with you. And may we use the rest of our lives here on this earth to help build your kingdom, to share the gospel. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, Amen.